right, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. And as we do on every Friday, um, this is a transformational talk um, from, from Red Hatters, external folks to Red Hat. We've got a great group of folks who keep coming back every, um, every Friday to have these conversations about changing organizations, DevOps, Dev Security, um, DevSecOps, and all kinds of other wonderful things. And today, um, I'm really pleased to have a colleague of ours, uh, Michael Dushi, who's um, recently come in and is part of the global transformation teams here at, at Red Hat. And he's going to talk about why change matters more than ever now and um, a bit about the importance of uh, DevOps in this new world um, that we all live in. And um, this is a, a reprise of a speech he gave a little while ago with a few tweaks because every day things change more. Um, and things shift even more and how we deal with all of that um, around the world um, and how we can apply some of the things we've learned from the DevOps um, world and cultural shifts. So I'm really looking forward to this talk and to the conversation with Michael afterwards. So um, I'm going to let Michael introduce himself, tell you a little bit about his background and um, deliver the talk. And then afterwards, please do join us for a conversation about the topic. So Michael, um, take it away and thanks again for um, taking the time today. Yes, uh, thank you so much for having me, Diane. Uh, always, always good to see you again and good to talk to you again. Uh, so as Diane said, my name is Michael Ducey. I'm um, trying to figure out how to advance these slides. <laughs> oh, technology, how does it even work? Uh. Of course. There we go. Finally figured it out. I don't know what was going on there. Uh, so as with computers, you know, as they say, how do they even work? Uh, so uh, happy Friday to everyone. Uh, or good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending upon where you're at in the world. So I'm Michael Ducey. I'm a co-founder uh, and organizer of DevOps Days Columbus. I also helped found uh, DevOps Days Minneapolis. Have a broad background in systems administration, capacity planning, sales engineering, uh, community development, and so forth. I've done almost, uh, it seems like, every job in a software company over my last uh, 20 years. Uh, I'm also an avid runner as well, and also an avid woodworker. And before 2020, I uh, was an avid world traveler, but of course, uh, everything has been changed. Uh, so 2020, uh, what can we say about this year? I think uh, uh, in the in the prep in the green room, uh, Diane was talking and she went to bed and everything was, you know, well, kind of normal, normal for 2020. And she wakes up and there's yet another curveball that we've seen uh, presented to us. And it seems like every single day when we wake up, while we are adapting to this new idea of normalcy, uh, we always tend to wake up and have this saying in our head. And of course, everyone knows uh, what this means, uh, but really, like 2020 has been uh, a constant uh, uh, cycle of us asking ourselves this question: you know, what the fuck? Uh, what what is going on 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 in, on in our world where every single day there's something new and new challenges that present themselves to all of us? And so, um, when I originally gave this talk back on July 9th, um, everyone uh, I'm sure knows what these numbers were back on July 9th. Uh, so July 9th, th almost three months ago, uh, it was 12 million uh, who had contracted the coronavirus and almost a half a million or just over a half a million people that had died from the coronavirus. <clears throat> As of October 2nd, when I looked at the numbers, uh, it's 34 million, uh, three or 34.5 million uh, and over a million people uh, who have died from this virus. And it really, when you start to put these numbers in perspective and really think of just in three months, we've almost tripled the rate of infection uh, and we've doubled the number of people that have uh, died of this uh, horrible virus, really starts to put things in perspective. Um, and when you see it presented like this, it really starts to make us think, you know, uh, what can we do and, 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 and how this has impacted us in some way. And, you know, um, the world has been forced to respond um, you know, we've all had to change our day-to-day -day life. Uh, we've all had to adapt to work from home. We've all had to adapt to schooling from home. 
uh, parents uh, are hard. It's hard for parents to find childcare, and they're having to juggle a job and kids in the house and giving them school and all of those sorts of things. And uh, it's interesting, though, is that as we've been forced to respond to this, kind of what was leading up to 2020, especially in the United States, uh, I won't necessarily speak to the entire world, but we're more than divided than ever as a nation, and, and uh, you know, on multiple fronts, but primarily. Uh, the political front ha has us really, really divided. And it's interesting that this division is happening at the same time when we uh, uh, see that our communities are kind of falling apart and being shattered, not only by kind of the division in our communities, but also um, the, the virus has caused our communities to be shattered as well. You can't go and see friends like you used to. Uh, winter is now coming and uh, things are going to be much colder. And so being able to do that social distancing picnic you were able to do with your friends over the summer, uh, those things are, are not going to be available to us. And so what's interesting is that uh, our communities have been shattered, not only our online communities, but also in our in-person tech communities and those things like that, and having to put all of our events on hold. Uh, but also, uh, this comes at a time when we need them most, right? And this isolation and this uh, inability to see people uh, and this inability to interact and see your friends and have that human connection. Uh, it's really, really somewhat ironic to me that uh, really been this perfect storm of all of these things coming together. So I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to talk a little bit about DevOps and digital transformation. I kind of want to set the scene here uh, a little bit around uh, how I think us in the DevOps community and us in the broader tech community can really start to ask ourselves some pretty poignant questions around how do we respond to this. So um, really where DevOps really came about is this idea of the rise of cloud and, and mobile computing, right? So we all of a sudden have all of these computers that we have to maintain. We realize as IT professionals, we need to change the way that we work. Uh, and really uh, also what's happened is with the rise of cloud and mobile, now that everyone has one of these in their pocket, and you know these these are uh, uh, these smartphones these days are uh, more powerful than some people's laptops in some cases, and now you have this idea of the connected consumer to where uh, this is the brick and mortar now. This is where you want to try and reach your consumer, and so with this rise of the connected consumer, we've had this rise of this idea of digital transformation, and so DevOps is really a response to serve digital transformation. So how do we make it easier to deploy our apps on a continuous basis? Uh, to these devices so that we can get these features and functionality in front of our end user and understanding that that's the feature and functionality we want to actually deploy. Uh, is it useful? Is it going to give us the business impact? Are we able to reach our consumer now in a digital way? And uh, the really interesting thing is if you think about uh, DevOps and what the core tenets of DevOps is about, and I would say, you know, we can talk about automation, we can talk about measurement, we can talk about bringing in lean principles, but whether if you're talking about internally inside of your company or externally in the broader DevOps community, uh, DevOps is really about community. It's this idea of bringing people together from disparate backgrounds, uh, understanding what their struggles are, uh, not only from a technology perspective, but also the human factors of things that, that really influences how they interact with that technology and use that technology. And that's one of the things that's been probably the most powerful for me as I've been involved in the DevOps days community over the last seven years is really this, this big sense of community that we have, uh, not only ex the external community, like the DevOps days community, for instance, but I've seen over the years how companies, when they start to adopt this DevOps uh, methodology or these ideas and practices of DevOps, inside of their own organizations, the communities really start to grow. Uh, and I think that's something that's, that's very beautiful that we have uh, in the DevOps community. But the other thing that we've talked a lot about in the world of DevOps is this idea of empathy. And you can look at empathy from a, a couple different perspectives. Uh, it can be ops having empathy for developers and what they're trying to go through and the struggles that they're having uh, to actually package up their code in a repeatable fashion so that ops can deploy it. It's development having empathy for operations and the job that they have to do and the governance that they have to bring in as part of that application deployment process. Uh, it's product having empathy for the end user and really getting feedback from the end user and doing something like user-centric design or behavior-driven development and those sorts of things as well. And so it's really about kind of understanding uh, uh, 
each other and understanding uh, um, what we all have to go through on a, uh, on a daily basis just to do our jobs. And also um, understanding that sometimes we have bad days because we do have all personal lives. And I think this is one thing that's really been highlighted is um, as everybody's had to shift from this work from home mode, uh, the empathy has really had to go up uh, across the board for everyone. We have to um, you know, put up with interruptions on conference calls because we don't have spaces in our home sometimes to have our own office. Uh, you know, kids are interrupting and things like that. And it's really been interesting to see how nobody cares about the dog barking on the conference call anymore. Nobody cares uh, that the baby cries or anything like that. We've really uh, taken uh, a change of mindset and being more empathetic. And I think that's one reason why is because we're all in the same situation and the entire world is going through uh, this, this exact same thing with the coronavirus. And so if you take a step back and think about DevOps and DevOps is about community and DevOps is about empathy and DevOps is in service of digital transformation. What's interesting though is digital transformation really kind of focuses on uh, this idea of capitalism. And uh, you know, I won't say whether or not dev capitalism is good or bad. This isn't a debate on capitalism versus socialism or different economic models. Um, but the interesting thing is, is you end up creating this kind of um, um, tension between dev digital transformation and DevOps. And we have this big community idea, we have this idea of empathy, but then when we're actually going to deploy that application, it's all about how can we get uh, eyeballs on this device so that hopefully uh, consumers will go and buy our company's product. And digital transformation is really about this idea of consumption and, and how do we drive consumption. Uh, and so, my slides are messing up, just one second, sorry about that. And so, what digital transformation, if we really look at digital transformation and what it's about, is it's really about uh, or how it's manifested itself. It's, can I get a car yeah, easily? Can I order food uh, online? Uh, can I watch my favorite shows? Or uh, can I uh, meet someone uh, handsome like Ryan there? Uh, and, and I ask ourselves really like, uh, what does digital transformation do to serve uh, the people, right? So while all these things are great, there's a certain economic barrier that you have uh, to get into using these things. So not everyone has the advantage of using Uber on a day-to-day on -day basis. Not everyone can fly from Amsterdam to San Francisco. Well, very few people can fly from Amsterdam to San Francisco right now. But if in a normal world, very few people could do that uh, as well. And having those economic means uh, to actually uh, take care of your life uh, or to have these things that are kind of bonuses in life, right? And make people with a certain economic status better. And so I really ask ourselves, you know, what does digital transformation do to serve the people? And I think um, this is one of the things that's really been highlighted to me uh, by this whole COVID crisis and, and the coronavirus crisis. If you look at what the states had to do to try and respond to the unprecedented number of claims of uh, uh, unemployment in the United States, uh, we really start to saw, see that digital transformation really isn't serving a lot of the basic needs of the people. And there's lots of good stories, though, also that's come out of this of how uh, we have been able to use digital transformation to deploy contact tracing apps uh, in certain places throughout the world, uh, to deploy applications to uh, help people's lives and make people's lives better. There's a good story that I heard um, um, about a bank uh, and, um, you know, they were getting a lot of traffic to the account summary page uh, and it was a little bit too much traffic. So they wanted to try and find a way uh, to cut that traffic. And the reason why they were getting all this traffic is people kept logging into the website to check to see if they had gotten the IRS $1,200 stimulus payment. And so what they were able to do, because they were able to work in a more agile way, and I think this is a good way of, of, of using digital transformation to serve people, is they gave you the ability to say, uh, uh, sign up for a text message, and they would send you a text message when the IRS uh, treasury line uh, went in your account. And they were able to send that push notification so that you knew uh, that the check was there and they didn't have to constantly go in and constantly be checking 
their website and putting too much strain on their website. And so the other question is, you know, what does digital transformation do to serve the underserved people? And how can states and governments use digital transformation to really start to make sure that the underserved people in our world or our communities are actually served? And so what does digital transformation do to serve uh, the underprivileged, the poor, the oppressed, uh, and society as a whole? And through my experience, you know, uh, traveling around the world, I think I've really met um, one person whose organization was using digital transformation uh, to really serve uh, those people that needed it most. And this was an example of an app. Um, this is a gentleman by the name of Sam who used to work at a company that created an app um, where homeless people could use this app and they could actually go and look to see where's the nearest clinic, where's the nearest place shelter that they could sleep, where's the nearest food bank or uh, uh, food kitchen where they could go and eat. And they were able to get access to all of these social services through this application. And I think that's a great example when we start to ask ourselves, you know, how as IT leaders in the industry, we can start to use digital transformation and these principles of DevOps and community and empathy uh, to actually use technology to serve people rather than use technology to drive consumption and to increase capitalism uh, in our society. So kind of taking a little bit of a shift, um, in 2014, um, we really started to have this movement and we've really started to, I think, have a higher awareness uh, around uh, inclusion and diversity, uh, but not in just inclusion and diversity in the sense of, do, are we making sure that there's enough women speaking at a tech conference or something like that? But really, uh, this movement started in 2014 with um, the shooting by, of a, a gentleman by the name of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, you know, right or wrong, we don't need to get into uh, who Mike Brown was or anything like that. But regardless, uh, another black man's life was taken by a police officer. Uh, and at that time, what really came out of that was this movement of Black Lives Matter. And uh, for me, this was kind of a, a poignant time to really, um, in 2014, to really start to think about uh, race relations in the United States and how uh, there's this systemic uh, racism that happens. And sometimes it doesn't even happen intentionally. There's just cultural biases that we've baked in uh, to the way that the th we think and the way that we act that kind of manifest themselves uh, in this way to kind of keep the status quo going. And 2014 was really interesting to me because as I watched those uh, protests in Ferguson, as I watched what happened with Mike Brown, you know, Ferguson was an area uh, that I was quite familiar with. Uh, well, quite familiar with in that I used to drive through there uh, every day as I was going to university from where I lived in St. Louis to uh, the university on the northwest side of St. Louis. And uh, if you've never been through, through those communities, it's really hard to understand uh, what those people go through. And I had a few friends in those neighborhoods as well, uh, as well. And so just a little bit more about me. I grew up in the inner city of St. Louis. Uh, I went to a school named uh, Roosevelt High School. Roosevelt High School had um, um, the, um, I guess, honor, if you will, or uh, unwelcomed honor to be the first uh, high school, public high school in the state of Missouri to have armed officers walking its hallways. Uh, there were a lot of gangs, there were a lot of drugs, and it was a really um, uh, hard educational experience. Uh, I actually ended up dropping out of high school uh, at the age of 16. And um, a lot of my friends were black, uh, and we experienced, uh, you know, kind of this systemic racism on a day-to-day -day basis. We would get stopped as we were walking down the street uh, just because of the way that we dress, just because of the color of my friend's skin. Uh, I was uh, put into that same bucket and, and harassed the same way uh, that many black people in the United States are harassed on a day-to-day -day basis. And that really, that shared experience uh, in my teenage years really kind of helped me begin to understand what those people go through. Um, you know, by no means am I an expert on this or do I uh, say that I've experienced 
the same things that uh, a black person in the United States do, uh, by no means. But having that small bit of shared experience has really helped me have uh, a broader worldview about this. And if you don't know about St. Louis, um, you know, this is an article by, I want to say, Gawker, uh, where they, they asked the question, is they were actually looking at many cities throughout the United States to kind of find what is the most racist city in America. And, and St. Louis is definitely up there. I remember uh, as, a, as a youth, um, there was a big controversy because the KKK wanted to sponsor uh, highway cleanup along Interstate 55 on the south side of St. Louis. And there was a lot of controversy about putting the sign up and all of those sorts of things as well. Uh, for a number of years, St. Louis had a 4th of July parade, which was called the Veiled Prophet Parade. Uh, and if you look at the Veiled Prophet, uh, well, the whole Veiled Prophet community and kind of secret society uh, was all affluent white people. And the Veiled Prophet, if you go and, and look it up, um, the Veiled Prophet looks very much like uh, a Ku Klux Klan member in their white robes. And so how do you have this community where African Americans or black people uh, can be welcomed uh, when you go to the 4th of July and the Independence Day Parade, and the Independence Day Parade is named after this uh, really, really horrific uh, figure uh, and this hor horrible secret society. And to give you a little bit more color about St. Louis, um, you know, of course my slides aren't working. So this goes my punchline. So to kind of understand how divided the city is, uh, and this is still very true to this day, uh, so white people avoid North City, black people avoid much of South City, South County, and West County, and that's that. Try being black and driving through a city like Ladue, which is a very affluent uh, part of St. Louis, or even worse, St. Charles, or in some places, Jefferson County. And the fun part is, is that the metro area just keeps getting more and more spread out as white people move further and further away from the scary black, black people that populate the city and the inner ring suburbs. And another uh, thought from this ar article, so these are comments on that article that I showed earlier, uh, as a black person that grew there, grew up there, fuck that place. And the thing is, is, you know, if you've never been in those communities, if you've never been in someone's home who lives in those communities, if you've never seen what people go through on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it's very, very hard to understand. Uh, not only are you living in a neighborhood that's blighted, uh, maybe uh, you're of a, of a social, certain economic status or socioeconomic status, uh, you don't see opportunities, your schools are some of the worst schools in the country. Um, it's very hard for you to understand what people have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And the very important thing to understand is this just isn't about St. Louis. This is repeated over and over and over and over again in our inner cities and in our urban areas um, where people don't have the opportunities and aren't presented the opportunities to actually raise themselves up out of poverty and to raise the socioeconomic status uh, of, their, of their families and their communities. And you have to really kind of ask yourselves, you know, how do you, uh, how do these people get the opportunity and how can we actually begin to help uh, lift people up rather than continue to kind of oppress them with the systems that we've built over time? And to kind of put this in perspective, um, I feel like I skipped a slide again. All right. And so to kind of put this in perspective, um, using numbers uh, and just not pictures, but you know the real medium household income from 1950 uh, or about 1968 it looks like uh, until 2017, and you can really see the economic disparity by race. And I don't think most of us really understand um, what it means to be a different color in America and how this actually impacts your day-to-day -day life and the opportunities that you have and the ability for you to pull yourself uh, out of those situations where you are in poverty. And if you look at, um, you know, African Americans, uh, Asian Americans, uh, or I'm sorry, blacks, they make $40,000 where Asians make uh, almost double that. Uh, and, you know, whites make $28,000 more. And so it's very easy for us to say, 
uh, economic opportunity is spread when we see uh, all of our friends who look like us having these good jobs and things like that. But it's very hard to understand what other people will actually have to go through when you begin to break it down. And I think this is very poignant and one of the things that uh, has really crossed my mind as I look at this is uh, we work in tech. Uh, we get paid extremely well to do what we do in tech. And we've had for a number of years uh, been talking about gender uh, balance in tech and getting more women involved in technology. And, one, and which I think is a, a great thing, you know. Um, it's still to this day that women make uh, 80 to 75 cents per dollar that a man makes. And that gap needs to close, but that's not the only gap that needs to close. We have a very unique opportunity to make sure that when we're hiring and we make sure that we're building our communities and when we're able to build our in-person communities once again, that we're making sure that we're reaching everybody in the community and not just the people uh, that look like me. And then the other thing I kind of want to look at as well is as we look at like what are we doing to begin to actually serve people. Um, this is uh, public spending as a share of national income. And so you can see that the growth uh, since the 70s has really been about taking more and more of our national income and putting it into law and order. And uh, in many cases, we've been reducing the amount of our national income that we've been putting into welfare, welfare and social services. And uh, the other day in the debate, and you know, we don't need to we don't need to say whether if you support Biden or you don't support Biden or who you support. It's regardless uh, of that. But Joe Biden made a, a really good point in the presidential debate the other day, where he said. Um, he doesn't want to defund uh, police. He actually wants to fund them more, but he wants to fund them in a way that the social, the police and community policing starts to transform to where it's much less about law and order and um, kind of keeping these communities in check as it's being treated now and a us versus them mentality. But how do we uh, have the police have ownership in those communities and how can we begin to bring in social workers and other people to actually help lift these people. So if you would think about how the funding would actually be, it's not necessarily about defunding law and order, but it's shifting money and providing more money to make sure that these social safety nets are there and making sure that the welfare programs are there where we can actually begin to lift people out uh, of poverty and their socioeconomic uh, status. Because if you can get you know, one or 10 or 100 people that all of a sudden have good paying jobs, that helps their family, that helps their extended family, that helps the broader community, and they can reinvest that money to, into things that actually matter to them and community uh, services and resources that actually matter to them uh, uh, as well. And so it's and this idea of and do we invest in control or do we invest in uplift, uplifting people? And there's the saying that says, you know, a riding rising tide lifts all boats. And to go back to kind of the economic example, for the longest time in the United States, we've had this viewpoint that if we uh, give uh, tax breaks to the wealthy, and of course everyone knows this is called trickle-down economics, if we give more money to uh, the rich, then they're going to spend more and they're then going to reinvest it in the economy and they're going to, uh, eventually it all trickles down. But there's also the economic idea that you, if you invest in those that are lowest of us, that the rising tide will lift all boats. And I think it's really important for us to ask ourselves as we move into this election cycle, what are, uh, and, and as we go to vote and we, as we're filling out our ballots, is what are we doing to actually make sure that we're lifting all boats and that we're making sure that everybody uh, in the United States have opportunities uh, like we do, like we're very privileged to have in the tech community. And so I really think that uh, we really need to think about this idea of de destroying these systems of oppression. I think we really need to have a long, hard look at ourselves and ask ourselves, what do we do on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that these systems stay in place? And what can we do as individuals um, uh, to start to break down these walls and break down these barriers and break down these things that, you know what, we don't even realize that we contribute to. 
we contribute to them through our unconscious biases uh, that we might have. Um, whether if you're screening resumes or something like that and you just automatically push one aside. Um, you know, there's, there's little things that we do every day that kind of contribute to this. And do we ask ourselves every day, am I doing something to make sure that I'm breaking down these walls and breaking down these barriers uh, every day? And I really think we have a, a unique opportunity to do this. And I think uh, as we start to go into the next year and as we uh, hopefully start to come out of this coronavirus pandemic, um, we have this unique opportunity to ask ourselves whether if we're going to make the world a better place and whether if we decide to lead this change uh, in our communities, not only our tech communities, but our broader uh, communities at home and the places where we live and the communities that we live in every day. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll open it up for questions, but I want to say uh, thank you very much uh, and thank you for taking the time to listen. Well, thank you. Um, and it's very poignant um, and, and very timely talk, and I, I really thank you for, for taking the time to, to share it. Um, and if, if folks have questions in the chat or if they want to, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you and, and you can join in. I think it's, it's really interesting, um, I mean, destroying our systems of oppression um, and digital transformation in the same talk. Um, but one of the things, the takeaways, and I think we've had a few talks with Jabe and other folks, um, but the idea um, of DevOps culture and ideas and digital transformation and applying them to these problems of like policing and um, creating empathy between the police and who is policed and um, breaking down the barriers to those conversations uh, with, with the different social work and support services and and reinventing and reimagining how those processes are. That's very much like what we've been doing in the DevOps communities and, um, you know, and we have the skills. Um, I came out of the, the Django and Python um, communities and even Drupal back in the day and, X, you know, XML and like all, a lot of the skills that we promoted to create diversity within our tech communities. Um, can be reapplied in the real world, shall we say, outside there, outside of the matrix or whatever that is um, that we're living in right now. But I think that's um, one of the key things is the shared experience and creating that yes. empathy. And so, yes. yeah. Uh, yeah. Know, those those were the hardest things to do between ops and dev. Um, yeah. And now they're very hard when the world is so divided. So maybe a, a little bit about what you think we can do to, to create those points of empathy in the real world. Yeah, um, so kind of going back to your point on, um, you know, Django and Python and PHP, and, you know, I've been a contributor of open source communities or a participant of open source communities and a, and a contributor over the last 20 years. And what's really been interesting to see is um, these, these communities aren't local to the United States. These are global communities. Yep. Um, and, you know, you're definitely right about this idea of creating the shared experience within that open source community to where then we can begin to empathize a lot more with others. You know, I would probably say the, much like the open source communities, the easiest way to start to build empathy and building that shared experience is getting involved somehow. Um, I have a friend who was telling me a story of how uh, she volunteered at uh, one of the missions down in El Paso, which helps uh, immigrants and refugees uh, at the border. And it was, a, uh, and she's not American, um, um, and she really, really began to empathize much more with what those people going through when you see it firsthand, when you actually see that these people have absolutely nothing and they've given up everything that they had in their home countries or what little that they had in their home countries with this hope and this idea and this dream that they were going to come here and make something better for themselves. And when you begin to really see that and the, the point of view that she gave me is that if she'd never volunteered like that, she wouldn't have that shared experience of really understanding what people go through. And as I drive around uh, kind of out of Columbus where I live 
and seeing people with um, um, signs that I don't necessarily agree with, let's put it that, but they live on a farm, they live in the middle of nowhere, they don't have that ability to have that shared experience and the only way that you're going to get that is by getting involved and getting into those communities. Just like how we build the shared experience in the DevOps community or in the open source community, it's all about going and finding a way that you can get involved. And that, that kind of, uh, you, you talked about the connected um, customers and that, and that, and I sometimes riff on this idea of um, continuous connection creating the spaces to make those connections. It get It's harder in a COVID world when it's all via Zoom yeah. and, and virtual, but there's still ways you can get out into your communities. But I think one of the things that we try and do, um, at least at Red Hat and in the OpenShift Commons, is to create spaces for people to connect, um, whether they're virtual or, you know, text messaging or TikToks or whatever it is, but how, meeting people where they are. I mean, oh, yes. you can't, you maybe I can't go to El Paso and be there to, you know, help um, in food feeding or clothing or supporting people um, with services there. But there are things you can do. And, you know, and I think that's really one of my goals now in knowing that I have these privileges, that I have yeah. access to these tools is to create spaces where you can bring people in who are economically underprivileged or um, education and, and offer these things up um, either free of charge or do the mentoring um, online yeah. with people. There's there's a lot of ways we can contribute, um, but I think the other and thing- And there's a ton of free resources, I think, as well, right? So like if yeah. you think about our broader communities and, um, you know, as a tech person, we could very easily start offering online courses, right? We could we could get people in the community together, we can get them on a Zoom call. We can start walking them through a lot of the free resources like, you know, openshift.io or anything like that, where we can really start to educate and, and teach people how to use technology and, and, and enhance their careers, right? And I think that's why, uh, you know, like women who code and uh, black set code and other things like that as well are great communities that really uh, um, we can could find ways to contribute to uh, or help out or financially support or whatever it might be. Uh, and so there's tons of opportunities just within our tech community uh, beyond just the broader community. I think that, yeah, and the, the other tie-in to um, digital transformation is capitalism um, that you were chat chatting about <laughs> earlier, talking about. I love that, but I also love, um, you know, the awareness that not everybody has access to the technology. So um, these kids who are trying to do, you know, told that they have to do online classes and they don't have the the money for a laptop. They don't have they don't Wi-Fi. Wi yeah, they don't have Wi-Fi. And, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a huge digital divide in the United States um, yep. with access to, like, I'm, I'm sitting in a rural community in Canada, north of Vancouver, and I have fiber optic. Right, that's that's privilege. The the Telus CEO moved in and built a house up the up the coast for me, and we became the first rural community in all of Canada um, because he wanted his summer home up there. Love you, Telus. Thank you very much. I'm paying my bill. Uh -huh. But um, it's it's that kind of becoming more aware of where where it breaks down. Yeah, um, I saw. A great, yeah, and I, I that's saw a good. A, sorry. I'm sorry. I finished. Yeah. So a great thing about I think it was um, Singapore uh, that um, the elderly didn't have cell phones, so they created these G for um, contact tracing for COVID. So they created these things that look like a tile or a little GPS thing that had the the app embedded in it, so they didn't have to be on a cell phone. But creating new things like that, I mean, it is also Big Brother supervising and, and watching this. But the grandmother who was being interviewed. It was obvious that she, one, didn't even have, you know, a flip phone to use yeah. and wasn't going to do this. So how do you do contact tracing for the elderly or the infirm? Yeah. Um, and, and someone came up with this brilliant thing. And, you know, as, as long as it, we don't have them dog tagged yeah. to us for the rest of our natural yeah. lives. And definitely one of the more vulnerable populations that need it probably the most. Yeah. Uh, as well. Yeah. The, the idea of access is... Um, is definitely one that 
we've thought about in the tech community for a while. Um, I remember the one laptop per child program mm -hmm. uh, when that came out in you know 2001, 2003 timeframe. Um, and I remember thinking, and this was before I had ever stepped foot outside of the United States. Uh, and I remember thinking like, well, why, why is a laptop so important for someone who lives in Africa or India or, or wherever it might be? And it was like, shouldn't we be, you know, investing all of this money in food and other resources that these people could use on a more immediate basis? And, um, you know, it was always explained of like, well, if they can get on the internet, then they can learn how to make a well, they can learn how to build uh, a farm, they can learn how to do this. And I still didn't really get it. And I didn't get it really until I traveled outside of the United States and I went and went through some of these communities. I mean, literally just driving through these communities and really understanding the economic disparity that exists uh, throughout the world. And, and once I had that perspective, it's the idea of like, yeah, that access is extremely important to them. And that access is very important because if they can get on the online and get on the internet, then they can educate themselves. And they, as I said, they can really start to lift uh, their boats up by uh, bringing that tide up around them. Yeah. I think one of the other things that's happened um, with COVID um, and is when they do, when people have access to events, um, one of the things about not traveling to events uh, or gather, you know, open shift commons gatherings or summits or whatever it is, is that, that getting managers to approve your travel, paying for the travel, the hotel, the cost of registration has all been blown out of the water. I mean, it's yeah. kind of democratizing access to um, yeah. men mentors and tech talks and hands-on workshops and all of that and, and building those tools out and making them, making, building more awareness of them um, and doing more of that. It's, it's, it's not really a stress on the system to scale up um, a, a hands-on workshop. You can live stream yeah. it, as, as Chris Short's been doing tons of, and yeah. anybody can access it. It's free and it's freely available. So it's like these kinds of innovations. And I think it's an opportunity for the tech industry and probably all the corporate marketing events teams in the world to reinvent themselves. Yes. Um, yeah. in a way, I mean, to take advantage. We have, you know, obviously we haven't found the perfect conference tool platform yet. Um, I think it's yet to be built. Um, if I try one more, I'm going to scream. But it's like <laughs> the the idea that um, we now have all of these tools. We can build the apps. We can build platforms that are accessible, that are, you know, not firewalled. And because the content, this, this video that you're watching now later um, is infinitely reproducible um, and infinitely replayable um, on the long tail of YouTube or wherever it is. And it's accessible for anybody to watch. And as long as they have decent Wi-Fi and internet access. And I think that- And a computer. And yeah. a computer or, you know, some sort of device. Oh, device, yeah. Access to a library that's not shut down due to COVID, or you know, whatever whatever it is, the public resource that we can make available. There's so much we can do, and I really hope that some of the lessons that we learn from this um, pandemic and chaos in the world is how to take advantage and build better, more open and scalable um, tools for sharing information and educating people and giving access to technology. It's been, you know, kind of the promise of platform as a service. I'm just going to say this is that when I first got in to pause back, you know, nine years ago or whenever that was when we had our first, you know, Ruby on Rails platform as a service off Heroku launched or whomever it started it was that it was going to make it super easy to deploy an application, right. to build an app, to build a mobile app. And it has, but it's still, there's still barriers. Right, and we can we can do better, and um, I think that's um, a lot of us in tech have um, a lot of experience um, building empathy between dev and ops, between management and dev and ops, and end users, and building communities, and uh, you know, applying them and taking the time now, taking a step back from our day-to-day -day jobs, and really reaching out and and creating some of those connections is really, I think, kind of the most important thing.
we can do right world, now. World, sorry to interrupt, but the world needs more of us to interact with the world now more than ever. Yeah. Right. Like <laughs> it's oh. it's imperative, right? Because I, I I put a I put a link in chat. The flag behind me, you see over my head, is the city of Detroit flag. I'm from you know outside Detroit. And, you know, they still need laptops at the schools. They still you know, are looking for funds. How easy is it for, you know, you to go out to your company, you know, big tech company and say, hey, do we do donation matching? And then just set up a $25 a month, you know, donation to just your local public school system just to help them out. Anything, you know, women, of, women, women who code, blacks who code, any of those organizations will happily take donations to help them build. Right. Like it doesn't have to be a heavy lift necessarily. And, you know, you can live stream with a phone now. Right. Like so you have a phone. You can teach people how to do something in tech. Right. Like you can help somebody out right now. You really can. Yeah. And I think and, I, and if you go back and look at that chart that I showed, it's like you have the opportunity to make a significant impact on somebody's big. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's also, you know, I was just watching um, a recap of the um, the call for code um, winners and stuff. And like Emily Brandt, a shout out to her, did, you know, kicked off a um, domestic violence tracker app. Um, and, you know, there were a number of other ones as well. But, you know, the, the thing we can do with the tech that we have and the skills we have at our can have a huge impact and and I think that's that and the other you know there, there's so so many things that we can do with the tech to help others um, and the spaces um, whether it's corporate or individual or community based stuff that um, are out there sharing that um, if you can't leave your house or your community uh, the zoom stuff is amazing it's just you know being able to set up that you know I did an, an uh, last night, uh, another Zoom to connect with a bunch of people, and you know, it's just it gives you the sense of community. And it happened to be VMware women. Women in VMware invited me, a red hatter, to a, a, meet, a meet, virtual meetup, which I thought was great and um, very for open them. Event. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, that's the other thing that um, you know, Adam Jacob of Chef kind of taught me is like. Um, and we're all in this together and so we might wear different jerseys uh as yeah. uh, another friend always would say um but always be kind to one another always be welcoming to one another it doesn't necessarily matter that i have a red hat jersey on today uh and you have a vmware jersey on uh we can still be welcoming uh and invite others into our community yeah. even though it's it's community. like i tell everybody right like I wear many hats at Red Hat. It's not just the Red Hat, right? Like yeah. Diane, perfect example, right? Like OpenShift Commons, she doesn't just wear one hat at Red Hat, right? Like there's there's a lot of things that we do out in the community that everybody can help do and can actually improve your community right here, right now. I, I think the other challenge is um, burnout as well. I mean, we're what, six months into um, the COVID crisis, and um, one of the reasons I really wanted to have Michael on here is to sort of re-inspire me. I'd heard your talk earlier, um, and to really um, to to do more uh, because I think at a certain point we um, get inured to the craziness, to the chaos. We wake up in the morning and there's another like, oh my God, could that possibly have happened overnight? I just went to sleep, right? Um, and yeah. some of us aren't sleeping very well. Um, and, and it shows, but it, it's like, I think we have to be careful that we're not burning out, that this is, um, I don't want to be um, a doomsayer or anything, but it's it's probably going to get worse before it gets better um, and with, as we go into flu season, yeah. as we watch things spike. And, and I'm saying that from up in Canada, um, but my family is down yeah. in Massachusetts and Los Angeles, and so I'm, you know, watching things go, you know, haywire. And, you know, we have to take care of ourselves, um, take care of our families and our health, um, but also be able to figure out how to um, engage um, with our communities in, in safe and healthy ways and help lift up other folks. It's been, it's it's a challenge to keep um, inspired um, and um, on, on topic um, with, you know, 
creating these communities and spaces for folks. And so, um, like next week um, on Transformation Friday, um, we have Sasha Rosebloom um, coming out, Rosebaum, sorry, um, Divine Ops, and we're going to talk about creating allies and, you know, some of the experiences that we've um, we've a lot of us have in common around being trolled and dealing with things around that have um, can we can use those in today's conversations you know when we watch the divisions between yeah. folks how do we how do we bridge those gaps between people and and I, I think those are skills I mean I'm really grateful for you know the experience I had in the Python community um, and Django and and Guido and you know, he may be a, a, a benevolent dictator for life, or I think he stepped down from that role, but the openness with which they created that community and, and my luck at being a Python developer um, and coming, you know, basically coming out into that tech community and being supported and having uh, spaces, those, those kinds of things we can do um, for our underserved communities. We can take those skills, the things that we learned in the open source. And the other day, um, I don't know, Chris, if you were on the um, the TOC call, uh, the CNCF TOC call, and I Paris, missed it. Yeah. Paris Pittman um, was talking about um, the contributor ladder. So yeah. I really, really like the idea of like on first, just as you know, this is a tech thing, but for open source communities, creating these, actually documenting what it's what the ladder is to get up. To be mm -hmm. a contributor, to actually explicitly I actually stand. mentioned that in a meeting before this in our case uh, marketing yeah. meeting. Like, there's not a great documented way. There will to, be. like how do you onboard into the community, right? So like getting that message out there is something we have to work on, right? Like GitHub is not great at discoverability, right? Like you've got to actually market some things in a way, right? Like it's it's interesting that we have to do that now. Yeah, when, and I think that's part of part of it is. Um, that there's in this this case it's about getting some uniformity onto the onboarding um, and becoming a contributor process across all of the CNCF projects. Um, some of them do great yeah. jobs and others not yeah. so much. And, yeah. and I I jokingly said that they all needed life coaches. Mm -hmm. Every every CNCF project needed a life coach <laughs> and, or a DevOps coach. <laughs> kind um, of yeah. Because and you know yeah. and that's really what I think. Um, as community people and open source um, DevRel and DevOps people, we do, you know, we try and help people do that, but to have some uniformity in that. And I think that's true, like, there's a lot of um, websites out there and we probably should have a re uh, resources page here of things you can do in your community if you're a tech person or, you know, mm. to, to, to donate, to be participatory in these things and to help. But a lot of the problem is finding them. Right. And knowing how right. you can become that contributor and how you can. And, and so I think the better job we do in the tech of making sure that those are explicit and clear and fair. Um, um, and then once we know what the steps are coming in and mentoring people who want to be there at each of those steps is really kind of key, uh, too. And I think, you know, I keep coming back to, you know, that statement you made, Michael, DevOps is about empathy. You know, it's like if we remember how hard it was to make our first contribution, to yeah. package our first Python, you know, pip, uh, you know, doing, you know, our very first things um, and have empathy and then realize empathy plus all of the, the different things in the world that um, people don't have access to, the training, the, even the, the language and every time we use and make up yet another acronym, that is mm -hmm. another way we need to decode um, our world and make it accessible. Yeah, I just want to mm -hmm. touch on something that you you mentioned. Then, kind of as we think about like the tech community and open source communities, you know, um, Diane, you and I have known each other for Ever. Eight, nine years at this point now, um, and I can remember you know going to conferences and it being a much different world than it is now, right? Uh, and I, I think we we sometimes get hung up on like we constantly we need to improve we need to improve diversity and inclusion isn't where it should be and, and I'm not saying by any means that the problem is fixed but it's really interesting to see that when when we as a community as a whole we've decided to make this big shift and this big change around diversity and inclusion diverse 
diversity and inclusion. Diversity. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> like we've made a lot of progress by a lot of people in the community saying that this is not acceptable anymore. We're going to make changes. We're going to make our uh, uh, communities more inclusive and more diverse. We're going to make sure that uh, it just all doesn't look like people like Chris and I. Um, yeah. And so I just kind of want to re think that we should reflect on that. And by no means are we done doing that. But we've shown ourselves that we have the capability to make those changes if we just put our mind and our effort and start thinking a little bit differently about yeah. the way that we act and the way that we treat people in our community. Absolutely. I, I think Definitely. that we've done, we've done a, a huge amount of learning and growing inside of the tech community. There's tons more to do. Um, but I think the skill sets that we've developed and the, the conversations that we've had, whether they were hallway conversations or panel conversations about DNI, um, and the way that we've grown, grown it by making, you know, understanding the myth of meritocracy, you know, all kinds of things that we've, we've had to grow ourselves um, and mentor people along the way to, to grow them. And I think all of those skills, um, we need to now redouble and apply to this current set of, um, you know, very tough circumstances that people are going through right now and, and realize that where we have privilege and we have a lot, we're sitting here in nice heated houses, you know, with good internet access and, yep. um, and yeah, those really, of us that need heat have it, those of us that have it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's really amazing. Um, and I think my whole goal now is just to see where we can create spaces, create engagement and communities that support each other and um, reach out and support and bring, bring along other people too. Um, because that rising tide that lifts all, um, we're the ones. Um, it's not just the moon that's making the tide go up and down. Right. We, we have yep. to make that tide rise and bring yeah. people along. Definitely, um, 100%. So I um, think we're almost to the end of our hour. Um, and um, Michael, if you have any final words. Um, no, I just, I guess the one thing that I would caveat this with, you know, um, it feels a little awkward that it's uh, three white people having this conversation, but I also think that it's important because, um, you know, we, have a responsibility in our communities um, to make sure that people that look like us understand what's going on and, and getting some perspective into our communities uh, is is extremely important. Uh, and I also, you know, understand there's a long way for us to go as a society to improve these things. But if we don't start having the conversations, um, if I'm not talking to people that look like me about this conversation, then um, um, it, it's never going to happen, right? And, and we have to start having the conversation. All of us are responsible to have this conversation, I think, uh, which is why I wanted to have this talk today. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I think it, th we can't rely on others to educate ourselves, and we have to take right. that responsibility for that. And I think that's the gist of, of, of what we're, we're, you're saying and, and what I'm trying to do here, too, is not to push it on someone who's underserved or in, an under, in, a, in, in a place to make them have to educate us. Um, yeah. And I think that's, there's, and I, that we'll be continuing this conversation next week about creating allies and being good allies um, with um, Sasha um, Divine Ops and um, hopefully we'll just keep this Friday cadence of conversations going on um, and, and do that self-education and bring in guest speakers um, so if you're listening out there, um, please do join us again um, next week um, and every Friday for um, at noon Eastern and 9 a.m. Um, Pacific for these sort of what I call transformation Fridays, but um, maybe they're empathy Fridays. Um, might be the, <laughs> the better way is creating empathy and connection. So thanks very much. Um, kudos to you um, for, for taking the time today and we'll, um, we'll put this up on YouTube very shortly. So thanks. And, um, thanks again for having me. All right. Take care.